Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Early on in Metaphysics Book 1, Aristotle provides an initial account of Plato's own metaphysical views. And, you know, Aristotle was, in fact, Plato's student. So presumably, even if we can't find exactly what he's talking about in the Platonic Dialogues, there must have been some teaching that Aristotle himself was drawing upon. And this isn't the totality of his discussion of Plato. He will continue in the rest of the metaphysics and at other points in other works to talk about, for example, the forms and what role they play and whether it's a good doctrine or not. But he is providing us with a lot of discussion early on as he's tracing out his predecessors in terms of the four causes. Now, Aristotle credits Plato with only really using two of the causes. Using, and, and that means sort of formally recognizing and articulating. Because we know from Plato's Apology and from um, the Phaedo and, and other texts that Plato does in fact talk about what we could call the final cause, but he doesn't single it out as uh, something to study for its own sake, as Aristotle will do. So Aristotle says that Plato really only used two causes. What two causes are those? One is the essence, or what we call the formal cause by convention. And here, he, the locution that he uses is te tu tst, te standing in for Itia, which is cause, um, so the cause belonging to or deriving from what the thing is. So the structure or the, in this case, the form of the thing as we're going to talk about. And then he also recognizes a material cause, te kata ten hulen. Hulen is the matter uh, it, it's the originally wood, but it comes to mean matter in general. And uh, Aristotle identifies this with the substrate, the hupokemenon, that which underlies something. So you have form impressed on matter, and this is what we call a hylomorphic account. And he's, he's crediting Plato with something like this. Now, this discussion comes towards the end of that short section that's entirely focused on Plato, although bringing up the Pythagoreans by way of contrast as well. And he tells us that what Plato is doing applies on two different levels. So we have what we're probably all familiar with from having heard about Platonism. We have the forms and the forms are the form, the formal cause, for the sensible things, the many material plural things that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And then we have the one, Tohen, and that is the, in some way, the formal cause for the forms. Now, it gets quite interesting here because Aristotle also says, and he seems to be speaking from uh, some sort of authoritative basis again, that what Plato recognized as the material substrate, and he uses both terms there, that's why we translate it that way, hule and hupokemenon, what functions as that is the great and the small, or the large and the small, or the, the, the great and the, the, you know, whatever is at the very end of that. And these are conceived of 
in terms of quantity, you might say, mega, micron, right? And these are also comparative terms. Now he doesn't go on to explain exactly how this is supposed to work, but presumably this played an important role in Plato's teaching. What we're primarily interested in is Aristotle's own presentation here. And he tells us a little bit about what he takes to be the backstory of how Plato arrived at these ideas. Now, one thing he points out that's very important is that Plato had a resource that the previous philosophers, including presumably Parmenides and Heraclitus, didn't have access to. And that was dialectic. Dialectic as a discipline involving questioning and answering and trying to arrive at the truth of things through a process of inquiry. Now, because of that, Plato was able to take some of the ideas that were already out there and then his training under Socrates or Socrates influence at least, watching Socrates engage in this activity, and bring them together into a new synthesis that produced a new metaphysical account. Aristotle says that Plato studied under Cratylus, and Cratylus was holding Heraclitian doctrines. Heraclitus was a pre-Socratic philosopher whose works we only have fragments of. He wrote a book on nature, which unfortunately we don't possess in its entirety. But one of the things that the Heraclitians are definitely credited with in Plato's dialogues and in other places is this notion that nothing in this material phenomenal world that we see in front of us ever stays exactly the same. Heraclitus is credited for having said you can't step in the same river twice because the river is flowing. And so, you know, what you have to ask the question, well, what is the river then? It's something that's continually in change. And so are our bodies. And so are all of the things that we encounter. Now, Heraclitus went on and said that there's a logos that, you know, runs through everything and underlies everything. And perhaps that could be the same over time. But what's important here is that Plato is drawing the teaching that everything that we observe with our eyes, with our tongue, you know, touch, any of the senses, anything we encounter of that sort, all the material objects are continually in flux. They do not remain what they are over time, and they're not entirely what they are at any given point in time. So another way of, of saying this that Aristotle brings up is that nothing material is actually knowable. It could be perceivable, but it can't be knowable in any strict sense. That constitutes a problem. How can we have knowledge of things? How can we even talk meaningfully uh, about the things that we encounter? And this is where Socrates brings something new to the table. Um, Socrates focused on definitions, on trying to say what the thing itself, hoatos, in Greek, is. So Socrates would ask, don't give me examples of all sorts of instances of courage. Tell me what courage itself actually is. Don't give me all sorts of instances of friendship. Tell me what the core, the essence of friendship, the unchanging uh, definition of it actually is. And that's what they try to do in many of the Platonic dialogues, sometimes with some success, oftentimes without success. Um, the success that they had was, was rather limited to saying, well, this can't be a definition and this can't be a definition. So what would the definitions actually be of then? Not of the changing things, but rather of, and Plato uses two different words here that we translate in different ways. The ideas, we're just actually transliterating the Greek there. Idea is, is a Greek term. And then the forms, the ede, right? Eidos is singular for that. And Plato tends to use these fairly interchangeably. Aristotle distinguishes them to some degree, but doesn't quite explain at this point how they would be different from each other. So we can take them as synonymous here for this treatment as well. So definitions are not 
of the things that actually change, although they would fall into that definition, we're actually defining the ideal, formal, singular, non-material, whatever it happens to be, for that thing to be what it is. So if we're defining courage, we are defining an immaterial form of courage. If we are defining bed, then we are defining some ideal archetype of the bed that exists presumably somewhere. Now, Aristotle goes on and talks about the sensible, material, plural things, the things that we're used to encountering in our ordinary existence as um, having a relation to the form that he calls participation, uh, methexin, right? And this comes from uh, met, meta, echen, uh, and, and it's a technical term that, that Plato is actually, in effect, taking over and coining. And Aristotle says this is quite similar to what the Pythagoreans were uh, doing and saying that everything existed by imitation, mimesis of numbers, but Plato is changing the, the name to participation, methexin, of, uh, of the, the forms themselves. Uh, and then he says, as to what this participation or imitation may be, they left this an open question. And that, that's actually going to be a, a sticking point of Aristotle's view on, on Platonic philosophy and metaphysics in general. But the general idea here is that all of the plural things, for example, this book, this book participates in some sort of ideal bookness or archetype of book or pattern. Or the, there's many different formulations that, that Plato uses. A form of book that is more real and remains the same at all times. In fact, it's eternal. It's, in some respects, outside of time. Whereas within time, we have these material books that are never quite the same and are at best copies of the real book out there somewhere. Now, one of the issues that came up for the Platonists is, well, what about numbers? Plato sometimes uses them as examples in the dialogues that we have. Aristotle says that the Platonists, following Plato, regarded numbers as something in between the forms themselves and the material things. And he provides a, a sort of tantalizing account of this. Um, which is quite interesting. He says uh, he, he regarded the numbers as distinct from sensible things, whereas they hold that things themselves are numbers, the Pythagoreans, right? And he says that the, the numbers themselves or objects of mathematics, so we could think of other things along those lines, provide an intermediary. He goes on and he says, with respect to all of these, there is a material principle, which is the great and the small. And, and that may connect the numbers together as well. Um, but the essence, the what it is for it to be, what makes these things what they are, the, the formal cause is actually the one. Now, you might identify that, as many have done, with what Plato will call the form of the good or the form of the beautiful. Um, that is not actually discussed here. In this part of Aristotle's work, it's only discussed in terms of the one. But this is a pretty faithful depiction, certainly an interesting one, of what Aristotle took Plato, his teacher, to be setting forward as a fundamental metaphysical account, an account of what is real and how everything else is caused by it. It makes use only of two causes, and Aristotle thinks that that's going to pose a bit of a problem. 